All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this meeting of the uh, Arctic Policy Study Group for Commonwealth North. My name is Juanetta Ayers. I'm the Executive Director for Commonwealth North. Uh, today's uh, session on uh, powering the Arctic um, will begin shortly. Let me just begin with a few housekeeping rules. Again, if you're not a, a speaker or presenter today, please keep your uh, video and audio on mute. That will help preserve bandwidth and ensure uh, a good session for everybody. We uh, will be taking audience questions uh, on the Zoom window, a uh, Zoom chat window, or you can text questions to me at 907-230-2284. Again, that's 907-230-2284. So we'll have uh, uh, audience question and answers uh, coming up after the planned presentations. But before I hand it off to Mead Treadwell, I do want to acknowledge Isaac Vanderberg with Launch Alaska, who's joining us now, I see, but uh, is also a Commonwealth North board member and helped with the planning for this session. So we thank Isaac for that. And with that, let me turn it over to Mead Treadwell, our co-chair for the Audit Policy Study Group. Mead. Uh, good morning and uh, thank you, Juanetta. And uh, thank you all for being with us this morning. Uh, today, I think we've got a very interesting program and uh, I uh, also would like to thank Isaac uh, Vandenberg for helping us to set it up, but also Bob Cox, who is one of our co-chairs in the study group, who pushed us very early on. You might remember remarks he made in our very first meeting about the importance of energy in the Arctic. And uh, Bob has, of course, had a career trying to get fuel to places where uh, people would need it to not freeze in the dark. Uh, and I guess I would say that this is also one of the greatest potential areas of cooperation around the Arctic. Uh, there's been a lot to, uh, of work with the various Arctic, Arctic energy summits uh, before because they're, the challenges that we face are also faced in Greenland and Russia in, in, in uh, northern Canada. And Alaska has been a leader. So we're going to hear today from some of the leaders. Our discussion chairman is uh, going to be Rob Royce, uh, Royce, who is the director of deployment for Launch Alaska, and has spent the last 15 years nurturing the adoption of grid edge technologies in both islanded and grid connected power systems throughout the state and the Caribbean, as well as in the lower 48. And throughout his career, Rob has led his expertise to in industry, utilities, and organizations seeking to deploy game-changing technologies that decarbonize and electrify uh, uh, critical systems. Matt Bergen uh, has 20 plus years experience working on wind diesel power systems. He began working at Kotzebue Electric Association in 1998 during the first expansion of their wind farm. And he was KEA's project manager on the Wales High Penetration Power Project in Wales, Alaska. He helped design and build several diesel and wind projects at Kotzebue Electric. And finally, uh, Ingevar uh, Mathiasen, uh, and Ingevar, if I've uh, mispronounced your name, I apologize, he, uh, uh, established uh, electronic service, a telecom service company in Kotzebue in 1987. His company provides satellite internet service to 800 households in the region. And since 2009, he's continued his work with renewable energy as the energy and resource coordinator and now energy manager for the Northwest Arctic Borough, managing multiple renewable energy projects in 11 communities, including a wind diesel project, a solar uh, photovoltaic project, a biomass grant, a heat pump project, a pilot project, and energy efficiency for all the households, and recently a solar battery project in Shungnak and Kobuk, Alaska. So here, uh, from the report from the field, which is going to be very, very important for our report, uh, let me turn this over to Rob, and thank you. Thank you, Mead. I'm just trying to get my screen sharing going and hopefully um, everyone's seeing that now. I appreciate you having me today. Um, I appreciate the opportunity in particular to share with you a story that um, really excites me. I've been privileged um, over the last couple of years having worked with a large corporate to um, have presented this story um, around the U.S. at a variety of conferences and uh, it's near and dear to my heart. And I uh, have previously referred to it as uh, energy pioneers in Alaska. 
Uh, I'm particularly privileged to have migrated from in 2005 from Alabama to Alaska, and this is where I feel like I found my true place in the world, my home. Equally as fortunate, I have been able to work with many of what I consider the old guard in our utilities and greater power industry throughout oil and gas and mining as well. And during that time, I've witnessed an extraordinary evolution of the power industry from what was once considered a stalwart, uh, nearly immovable machine to one that is now advancing so rapidly, it's nearly impossible to stay abreast of the changes. The easiest way for me to imagine the incredible pace uh, that we're seeing today is through a short history lesson. So you'll pardon me if you're familiar with this. Um, I promise I won't dwell on it too long. But in terms of geological time scale, it's very difficult to truly grasp the short period of time that humans have been on the earth. A useful graphic is the one you see on the screen before you which places all of Earth's history around a 24-hour clock, as though the Earth's formation begins the day at 12 a.m. and present time ends the day at midnight. In this framework, the Earth forms, a tw forms at 12 a.m. and cools down from a molten state over the next several hours. The oceans form and the asteroid bombardment diminishes. Very primitive life cell, appear primitive celled life appears quickly before 4 a.m and photosynthetic organisms appear before 6 a.m. Right around noon, the atmosphere becomes oxygen rich, and by 5 p.m., the first multicellular organisms appear. The first aquatic animals don't arrive until 8 p.m. Plants colonize land at 9.30 p.m., and land animals follow at 10 p.m. The dinosaurs are the life of the party from about 10.40 to 11.40. And then human ancestors split off from the rest of hominids at only two minutes to midnight and modern humans arrive as the clock strikes midnight. The breathtaking brevity of our human existence on this scale is all the more striking when you consider the dramatic evolution of society as it relates to the adoption of modern technologies, such as the desktop computers and the mobile phones we're all participating in or with on this call today. Uh, inevitably, these must be not only the last seconds before midnight, but the last breaths as well. And similarly, the evolution of power systems in Alaska has been astoundingly rapid in the most recent years. To give you an idea of the pace of change, consider a similar 24-hour clock that starts in the late 1800s with Alaska's first power systems. These were by and large hydro-based power systems built primarily for large industrial centers such as mines. In fact, by the 1930s, or around 9 a.m., there were already 11 and a half megawatt of hydro-based generation in the state. Shortly after 9 a.m., MEA established what would become the first rail belt co-op to distribute power from the nearby Eklutna hydro facility. Around 10.15 a.m., the first utility-scale diesel powerhouse was brought online in Anchorage, the largest population center of the state. Interestingly, this power source actually sailed in the Anchorage. It was a 10,000 ton tanker named Sackett's Harbor that had broken up in the Aleutian Islands. It was beached at Sheep, Ship Creek and would provide Anchorage over 50% of its power from 1947 to 1955. This would actually become a relatively common theme in communities along the coast of Alaska who would reclaim old ships power systems to electrify their communities. Around 12.30 p.m., Alaska becomes the 49th U.S. state. Right at 1 p.m., MLMP begins installing the first of several natural gas turbines that would power Anchorage until just recently. Nearing 2 p.m., the Alaska Village Electric Cooperative was established, which would eventually come to operate 58 power systems throughout rural Alaska. Around 4.30 p.m., AEA was formed, primarily to finance and construct major hydro projects Around dinner time, Kotzebue Electric installed the first utility scale remote wind turbine and AVEC followed suit an hour later. At 9.27 p.m., the Renewable Energy Fund was established as well as the Emerging Energy Technology Fund a minute later. These funds would come to provide millions in grants to develop renewable energy systems throughout Alaska. Around the same time, the first megawatt scale wind turbines were installed on Kodiak Island and rail belt utilities shortly followed suit. At 9.30 p.m., the major rail belt utilities bring online new natural gas power plants. At 10 p.m., 
utility scale energy storage becomes commonplace. At 11.05 p.m., utility scale solar does as well. And 11.45 p.m., the capability to operate up to 100% renewable becomes the new standard for projects developed in rural Alaska. There are a few key takeaways from this perspective of power systems in Alaska that I'd like to share with you. First, with the exception of the natural gas power plants built by the rail belt utilities between 2013 and 2016, utility scale generation projects have become increasingly focused on renewables. Wind, and wind generation has been integrated into rural power plants since as early as 1997 and programmatically since at least 2003. Though these were often smaller wind turbines around 100 kilowatt each, rural projects have since begun favoring megawatt scale turbines where population allows. The rail belt utilities followed suit in 2012 and 13 with Fire Island and Eva Creek respectively. Somewhat surprisingly, utility scale solar has seen a surge in the last two years. Though Alaska's solar resource is largely mismatched with winter peak demands, the relative affordability, the simple maintenance, and the complementary summer production profile has been embraced with records for the largest project set and broken multiple times since 2018. Starting with 50 kilowatt systems in rural Buckland and Deering, and a 140 kilowatt pilot project on the rail belt with MEA in 2018, 2019 saw record solar projects first with 120 kilowatt in Hughes, then 532 kilowatt in Kotzebue, and a 1.2 megawatt solar farm in Willow, again with MEA. Interestingly, even preceding the solar surge of the last couple of years was an early adoption of energy storage, both on the rail belt as well as in rural power systems. Golden Valley was an early pioneer, not just in Alaska, but in the world, when they commissioned their roughly 26 megawatt energy storage system in 2003. This system received a variety of engineering awards, as well as the Guinness Book of World Records Award for the world's most powerful battery, which it held until just recently. CEA followed suit with a hybrid flywheel battery energy storage system in 2014, and HEA is currently constructing what will be Alaska's largest system of 46 megawatts to be commissioned in 2021. In reality, though, the rural utilities have adopted energy storage much more aggressively than rail belt utilities. With Quigilingak in 2012, Kodiak in 2013, Kotzebue in 2014, Kongiganak in 2015, Tuntatuliak in 2016, Kipnuk in 2017, and Deering, Buckland, Hughes, Pilot Point, Shafornak, and Cordova all in 2019, there are currently over a dozen utility scale energy storage systems throughout the state. What this means is that the power systems in Alaska are increasing in complexity. Where historically a system may have had up to two fuels in their generation mix, most often diesel or natural gas combined with hydro, they may, they may now have twice that. Some of the most complex systems in the state are no longer on the rail belt, but in rural Alaska where they are operating diesel and multiple forms of renewables such as hydro, wind, and solar combined with energy storage. Not only that, but many, if not most of these communities also incorporate some form of dispatchable loads, which means they are operating the most sophisticated power systems in the world. System operators from utilities like Duke, SDG&E, and PG&E are taking lessons from these communities and incorporating them into massive markets, both in terms of operation and integration, as well as regulation and policy. They're able to do that because not only are Alaskans exporting this expertise through organizations like UAS, Alaska Center for Energy and Power, which operates a power system integration lab that physically reproduces the actual power system of Kakanog, or through the Alaska Microgrid Group, which connects microgrid experts from our communities with experts from around the globe to share knowledge. Also, these systems require very sophisticated and automated controls that balance the dynamics of renewable generation and dispatchable loads with the most cost-effective and efficient dispatch strategy. Embedded in these systems are advanced algorithms that are refined through the institutional knowledge of our power plant operators and then exported around the globe. 
One example of these incredible systems can be found in Kodiak, Alaska. There, they have combined 31 megawatt of hydro at Terror Lake with nine megawatt of wind generation, three megawatt of battery energy storage, and two megawatt of flywheel energy storage to operate annually with over 99% renewable energy. Typically, the only reason that KEA is not able to operate at 100% renewable energy through the full year is because they still need to exercise the diesels for the very rare instance they are required to provide backup power. Beyond the obvious complexity of operating a fully independent power system with so many generation assets, the island of Kodiak also incorporates a very large crane, so large that it introduces consider considerable instability into the local power grid, enough to take the system down on its own. KEA's use of flywheel energy storage to completely mitigate the impact of the crane to the local grid garnered global attention and now represents the industry standard for managing dynamic port power systems. In fact, nearly mirror copies of KEA's storage system can be found in cities like LA today. Not accounting for matching funds or federal dollars, the state of Alaska has directly invested over $250 million in these advanced remote power systems or microgrids through the Renewable Energy Fund established in 2008 and the Emerging Energy Technology Fund established in 2010. With over 200 microgrids operating for over 50 years in the state and a total installed capacity exceeding 800 megawatts, Alaska has the largest install base of microgrids in the world. Meanwhile, the global market is estimated to be over $2.4 billion today and forecasted to reach over 5.8 billion by 2023. Our early work in microgrids and renewable integration means that Alaska is a leader in the global energy transition. Interestingly, rural Alaska actually vets and adopts new technologies well in advance of the rail belt and major grids worldwide, often by decades. Rural utilities have been incorporating utility scale wind since as early as 1997. Rail belt utilities didn't begin integrating megawatt scale wind into the grid into, until 2012. And though Golden Valley installed their land, landmark energy storage system in 2003, there were already more than six storage systems in rural communities by the time CEA commissioned their energy storage system in 2015. And there will be more than 15 in remote Alaska before HEA commissions their new energy storage system in 2012. Equally as incredible is the first demonstration of 100% renewable operation in Wales as early as 2001. Though the system fell into disrepair and is no longer operational, it nonetheless set the standard for what is possible. And today, there are no less than six rural power systems in Alaska capable of operating 100% renewable. The rail belt and much of the world is still a very long way from this astounding capability. But in rural Alaska, one could argue the ability to operate with no diesel online is the new standard for operation. In 2019, the communities of Deering and Buckland commissioned solar provided by Launch Alaska's portfolio company, Box Power. They combined this energy storage and microgrid controls with the community's existing wind diesel power system to operate up to 30% annually without their diesel generators. Other remote communities with plans to deploy renewables like Shugnack and Kobuk have followed suit by including project requirements for diesel off capability. Key to these advances are the efforts of local energy pioneers, two of whom, two of whom I have the privilege to join in presenting to you today. With that, I'd like to welcome Ingemar Mathiasen to provide us a regional perspective from the Northwest Arctic Borough. Ingemar? Good morning. So um, I'm happy to uh, be online and be able to talk to you guys about the regional perspective up in our region for why we are doing this. Why would we make a system more complex and harder to operate? And there's reasons for that. And I hope to show in the next few pages here, um, what's the driving factor of that. Got the next one there, Rob. So the obstacles, oh, one too many. 
okay, the obstacles to having uh, energy resiliency uh, to be able to manage it maybe one day even without the oil. It's the very remote locations. There's no roads or air, uh, no roads and air or barge is the only transportation. Logistics for making projects happen, the time factor. I was involved and uh, uh, commissioned this, uh, the projects in Buckland and Deering that uh, was uh, funded from the first round of, uh, uh, of the Renewable Energy Fund to get the two, uh, three um, wind turbines up, two in Buckland and one in Deering. And the logistics to get, get these projects up and running ran over several years due to the um, winter factor and, and uh, when you can actually move anything out there. The high cost of imported fuel, it makes everybody vulnerable to price changes. So in 2008, when, 2008 we made significant changes and decided to have an end use steering committee in place. Um, the small communities have a very low population density and makes the projects expensive per person. Um, the solutions would be to develop local energy resources, renewable and non-renewable, to hedge against the outside cost fluctuations and build capacity by re regionalizing and planning, which was, we, we have been doing up in, in our region since 2008. Uh, we're trying to update those plans annually or biannually and then we pr combine projects for economy of scale as much as we can. Next one. Okay, so in 2008-9, I jumped on as the energy coordinator for the region. And uh, we kind of wanted to get regionalized right away, but it's taking a long time to do it. And meanwhile, we created an energy steering committee where everybody could participate, all stakeholders, and we've been uh, successfully having meetings twice a year ever since 2009. So the vision for the Northwest Arctic is to be 50% reliant on regional, regionally available energy sources, both renewable and non-renewable for heating and generation purposes by 2050. And we lately we added to combat rapid climate change due to greenhouse gas emissions like CO2, methane, and other harmful effects of fossil fuel usage. Um, in 2008 and 9, that was not the case. We didn't have any uh, thinking about the global warming yet that ad was added on. Uh, we have about a 10% decrease of imported diesel fuel by this year, large, a large portion due to the very uh, forward looking work from Kotzebue Electric with wind turbines and solar arrays. And Matt's gonna talk more about that after uh, my presentation. We're looking for 25% by 2030. That's fine. So I have a couple of slides here. Historical oil prices, uh, you've probably seen this, many of you, and we are right around $40 something a barrel out there. The balls represents where we are versus where we were. So we basically are 2005 prices with, with uh, crude oil out there. Next one. But uh, the local retail prices in our region has not fallen accordingly. 2005 prices should have brought the average down to $4 in the region, but that has not happened. And this is uh, something that we keep puzzling about and why logistics in particular seem to become more and more expensive as times go on. Next one. Okay, so I have some slides on fuel prices. 2018, um, green went down a little bit in Kotzebue and we had a few uh, prices go up. You see what the prices were. Um, AVAC cost 296 loaded, 285, uh, so on. And, and Northwest started borough, which is the school system to the right was their prices landed in the communities. And then the other ones are retail for gasoline and stove oil, including tax. Next one. In 2020, this is in February, the prices went up some, both landed and uh, in particular retail. The red is increases, green is decreases. And next one. And here we are in October, we went up even more. Uh, Ambler is now 10.30 a gallon. And uh, uh, some of them went down just slightly. The fuel delivery cost went back down to where it was earlier, uh, kind of following the outside fuel prices in the world out there, of course. Next one. 
electric rates. So 2017 is where we were in electric rates. Uh, you can notice no attack down to 73 cents in the middle column, uh, almost 74. And we can go to the next slide. And then they all went up in 2018, all across the band, both the PC, um, yeah, back up again there, Rob. Both the PCE up to 500 kilowatt hours uh, delivered rates went up to 23, 24 cents, and uh, right across the band, 2018 went up. We'll go to the next one. But 2019, there were some drops. Uh, the outside world did drop after all. We went back down again on the PCE side, but the at rates above above 500 we went back up, and no attack. Uh, right there at almost 80 cents a kilowatt. The next one. And then we went up even more to 91 and a half cents in no attack by 2020 March. That's actually uh, current prices. It should say September there, but they were set in March and they are all about the same right now. Okay, so uh, up to that point, this is one reason why we decided to do this in 2008, 2009. Of course, we were facing this Hubble curve that everybody was scared of, everybody was gonna run out of oil and everything else. So that's kind of started it, <clears throat> but it's a survival issue. Uh, if uh, you wanna jump back one rub for me. If um, PCE goes away, for example, then no attack is gonna face 91 and a half cent per kilowatt, um, 91 cent per kilowatt um, electric rate. At that point, the community probably will more or less collapse and no electricity is going to be affordable and even the community buildings and everything else, not, nothing is going to function at a dollar, uh, close to a dollar electric rate. If PCE goes away or it decreases significantly, we're going to face households leaving communities moving to Anchorage. So the PCE fund is, is uh, really fundamental for what's being created as far as advancing civilization out in the rural communities. So it, since 2008 and 9, we then had a, a lot of different projects here. Uh, this is Northern Static Borough and in combination with NANA, where we're doing uh, different kind of projects. You can go to the next one there, by the way. Uh, for example, here's a solar water plant in uh, Kotzebue. Thank you. And uh, what it's produced over four years and its power curve for how it's producing it. You can see that April and May are pretty high due to the power underground. And uh, you go to the next one, Rob. Another one? Okay, I'll just listen to okay. this one. Yeah, can you Rob, bring that whole thing up? Can't see the whole slide there. Is that possible? Okay, that's better. Sorry about that. Anyway, this, that's okay. It's basically a chart. Um, Maybe go back to where you were. We can see some of them better that way. Just uh, on the presenting mode. Okay, so you can see what, uh, for example, Ambler up there is the first solar array we put in for the water plants back in 2013. Uh, and what it has uh, produced up until um, current date and all of them are in on this chart, if you have a copy of it or if you can get a copy later. We constantly monitor them to see what they are worth. Of course, when you first put in a solar array in a new project, you're kind of guessing a little bit what it's gonna produce year by year, but this is actually a chart that has been running since 2013, continuously updated with new data. So that show on the Amblerone, for example, that it's producing equalized performance installed uh, with a 14 kilowatt per gallon uh, uh, adjustment is 1.63 kilowatt hours uh, per day. I think it's going to show that. I don't know why this is this slide is messed up, Rob, but <laughs> it, it is anyway. We so we we uh, keep a track of the arrays, how well they perform over the years, 
so that we can see what the actual value is uh, and how much they produce versus the installed cost. Okay, we can go to the next one. We also have a biomass project up in Ambler, and we have well, there was one started in Coburg the year before that is operational. This is the Ambler one that is currently in up in uh, construction phase. We have the boiler up in Ambler right now, and and uh, uh, is installing that for twenty in twenty twenty one to uh, offset the community buildings and the washeteria up there. So it's not just renewables as far as that goes. This is non-renewable in a sense. We're using up the wood. It's renewable because it's, it can be re, uh, replanted, but we have to be really careful not to make biomass projects so big that it start denuding the country. The trees grow very, very slowly up in our region. And we're starting with two projects, one in Coburg that's been running for a few years and one in Ambler that will be full construction this year. Next one. Okay, so then we have, um, we went into uh, mini split air conditioners, heaters a few years back, and we decided to put a pilot project in, in Coburg and Ambler. So if, uh, go to the next one. For the, for you guys that are, uh, that mini splits are basically heat pumps that are reversible and you can heat or cool the house with it. So we decided to do some tests up in the Arctic to see how well they perform. So this is a solar, solar assisted uh, heat pump. The solar arrays are not connected to the grid. They're connected directly to the heat pump. So when the sun is out, it all helps offset the um, heat pump's usage from the grid. So the stovel cost, stovel cost in Coburg is 9.27 a gallon and kilowatt efficiency 14 kilowatt per gallon. So April gallon equivalent was 29 gallons of value, but in reality, they actually heated in April by 9.7 gallons, gallons worth of fuel by using the heat pump. So uh, we have heat pumps in all the communities up there at this point. We have a test project in uh, Kotzebue where six households are involved. And this is in collaboration with UAF to monitor how much those households actually offset diesel fuel versus uses the heat, using a heat pump in Kotzebue. And this is households that are using only toilet stoves as a normal heat versus the heat pump as normal heat. And within the year, we'll have some data from that project. Meanwhile, we have heat pumps in all the communities to see how well they fit in, how well they work, how people like them, and also data collected. So the next one. So this is the Ambler VPSO building that we put in place with two heat pumps. And the total cost for heating the duplex for six months was $290 on the heat pump running on electricity. And you can see what the actual bills were there, the heat pump draw in kilowatt hours, and then uh, how much it actually cost to heat the building. Now this building is, is a six star building. It's very well insulated. You can see the solar arrays up on the roof there, uh, but it, it showed the real value of using heat pumps in the Arctic. Uh, even though it's cold, through at least six to eight or 10 months in some cases, we're warming up, we have global warming going on. So people are using their heat pumps into December. They can use them into, uh, into z down to about zero degrees and then switch back over to uh, diesel fuel or, or wood. Next one. So we decided to do a whole um, community project. This one is all 70 households in Ambler, changing all LED, all lights out to LEDs at the same time, adding one kilowatt of solar onto the roofs of each household and installing a 12K single head uh, heat pump mini split in the households. The total cost 8,146 per household for a total of a little over half a million dollar. And we funded that with our village improvement fund. So that project is being constructed right now. It's at 95, 96% complete. They should be done with it um, completely with the LED swap out and everything in November. And then we'll monitor the whole community for a year to see where it all, all ends up and how it all balances out versus AVAC usage where 
they would definitely draw a little bit more electricity than before, but they will be using a whole lot less diesel fuel. So the first kind of complete uh, community overhaul for energy efficiency. Next one. So uh, what we've been doing together, uh, Nana and North Starting Berg together, in, we started in 2008-9, fully operational, now high penetration diesel off operation with 200 kilowatts of wind and 45 kilowatts of solar together with a battery. Diesel off has been achieved and working on lowering the electric rates. In Deering, fully operational high penetration diesel off operation using 100 kilowatt power of wind and 45 kilowatt solar together with a battery. Diesel off has been achieved and working on lowering electric rates there. It's, it takes a little while to, to get the rates down, but we have good hopes that their PCE rate should drop down to the delivered rate their households should be down at the 20 to 21 cents and the main rate coming down with it. Uh, in Norvik, <clears throat> we actually had funding to go halfway on a wind turbine and we, we are still not giving up on putting a wind turbine in Norvik. Um, there is a 23 kilowatt solar array and we, we are looking at the suggested build out, that's a typo there, for solar to 250 kilowatt and install a battery in Norvik too. We are also considering um, transmission lines between some of our communities, Norvik, Kayana, Selawik is within striking distance of each other and so is Ambler and Shunak to connect with, with the existing transmission line between uh, Kobuk and Shugna. And now in Shugna Kobuk, we have a high energy cost grant awarded for installation of 150 solar and battery for construction in 2021. We have actually increased that to 200 kilowatts and, uh, and adding some local in-kind funding, uh, hopefully here within a month. And we also have a proposed project for no attack that we are uh, looking for uh, funding for. So Shuna Kobuk No Attack is our most expensive communities in the region. Next one. Okay, so these are the pictures of the arrays. Uh, Buckland to the left, the Deering up to the right, and the, the little Norvik array down to the right. You can switch to the next one. And that's it. What's man without energy? Nothing, nothing at all. Thank you. Thanks, Ingemar. With that, I'd like to introduce Matt Bergen. Matt, are you uh, able to, I think you might be on mute. Ingemar, you might end up having to present for Matt. <laughs> well, I hope he comes on here. Well, I seem I to have this. lost him. and Maybe we'll proceed uh, for the moment. Um, Ingemar, would you like to, to maybe speak to some of Matt's slides or we can actually um, open up the conversation for some questions um, while we're waiting to see if Matt can get reconnected. Either way is good with me. Me? Do you have a preference? Would you like to maybe go ahead and take some questions? Um, yeah, let's go ahead. Uh, Juanetta, what do you think? Sure. Let's let's uh, let's go ahead and start um, with a couple of questions for Ingemar, and hopefully uh, we can get Matt. Um, he was on the uh, the phone number ending in, in 491, is that correct? That is correct. I, I asked him to unmute, um, but we may have lost him, unfortunately. Yeah, so we'll I, see I, see, I see him online, but... Uh, um, well, as always, these Zoom meetings are uh, nothing but fun and uh, excitement. Yeah. So if you're playing Zoom bingo today, yes. um, you can get that center square uh, for are you connected? <laughs> Well, I had, a, um, I, I had a quick question for Ingemar. Um, uh, he, uh, Ingemar, you talked about uh, uh, installing transmission lines between some of the communities in, in uh, the Northwest Arctic Borough. Can you speak to that to some degree? Um, 
is it is the plan to do some sort of utilidor project or what's the configuration of those transmission lines? Well, over the uh, 10, 11 years we've been um, having our energy steering committee, it's actually been on the agenda from the very beginning. <clears throat> we also have a potential hydro project up in the Kobuk area mm -hmm. that could be accessed if we could connect Amber and Shunluck, for example. It's a 25 mile long line and the financial studies we have done on it and that AVAC has done on it shows that it can stand on its own. Um, so uh, economically it works. And now how would we build it? So there is a, a potential corridor that we've laid that could do an overhead transmission, but there's also been discussion of a potential uh, DC line um, laid down into the tundra. Um, and that has been researched by, multi, by two, at least two different groups over there. Matt is coming back on. Is that but, Matt? Uh, uh, Matt, is that you? Yes, I called in on my cell. Can you okay. hear me now? All right, all right. Well, we'll, we'll stand back on the questions then and go ahead with, with, with Matt. Right on. Sorry about that. Must be. Uh, it's freezing up here. Things must be freezing up, including the water. So, um, <clears throat> good morning. Uh, my name is Matt. I'm with Cotsby Electric, and I'm going to talk about our our transition from diesel power to renewables for prime power, and essentially trying to um, minimize our amount of diesel power as much as possible. Uh, next slide. So a little bit about us. We're um, the hub of the Northwest Arctic Borough, 3,200 people with the 11 villages around us. Um, we've got a, since 1997, a wind diesel hybrid system. Uh, our average load, 2,500 kW um, to a maximum of 3,500 kW. Our minimum in the summer is probably about 1,500 kW. And we've got um, six diesel generators of different sizes that we can um, dispatch based on how much load we're trying to supply for the town and the time of year. Uh, right now we're importing about 1.2 million gallons of diesel. Um, prior to using renewables, we'd be, and without renewables, if we just turn them all off, we'd probably be at about 1.4 to 1.5 million gallons. And uh, we're down to 11 wind turbines to produce that's able to to produce about two megawatts total. Um, we previously had 19, and I'll talk about why we're down to 11 here pretty quick. And our annual energy production from wind is about 15 to 25 percent of our annual energy production. So about four to five million kilowatt hours we're producing from wind annually at this point. And a little bit about our cost. Um, with PCE, the residents and the municipality is paying about 20 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, customers that don't get PCE, the store, the hospital, the school, they're paying about twice that, so about 40 cents a kilowatt hour. Next slide. So we right now, here's our kind of a snapshot of our energy system. We've got 11 wind turbines. We have two large EWT wind turbines that are 900 kW each that produce the majority of our power. Uh, we have um, nine small wind turbines that we're slowly um, decommissioning. These are kind of first generation that are um, very high maintenance and we can't get parts for them anymore. And we're slowly uh, actually transitioning these old wind turbines to solar. Uh, we have now as of uh, end of June this year, we have a functional 530 kW solar panel array. We took eight of our 66 kilowatt wind turbines, unplugged the wind turbine and plugged in 66 kilowatt solar arrays. So we're essentially reusing the wind infrastructure, the wind power and fiber optic infrastructure to plug in solar. So we're achieving some project savings by reusing some of our um, installed wind infrastructure. Uh, since 2015, we've had a lithium ion battery here as well. It's a 1.25 megawatt, so it can only supply about a third of the town's power. So right now we're using it for essentially spinning reserve. 
Um, it helps us with outage mitigation and helps us um, keep the system up and running. Um, so it's another term is renewables firming. So when we have a loss of a wind turbine or something, the battery helps keep the power on and helps the diesel keep the system up. Uh, we've automated our, our diesel generation plant and uh, also replaced a couple of our older engines with a new uh, electronic fuel, electronically fuel injected um, eight cylinder EMB, which we call our wind engine because it's um, when we have a lot of wind, we just run this little little EMB engine and um, the rest is wind. So we're, we're achieving 75% wind penetration uh, regularly when the wind is, is strong enough. So that's been pretty, pretty fun. Uh, we also have a electric boiler at the local hospital here. So we're doing something called beneficial electrification. Whenever we have too much wind power, um, instead of um, not capturing the wind, we can do that with our wind turbines. They can pitch the blades and reduce their power output. We instead um, capture as much wind as possible and sell electric heat to the, the local hospital. That's been in place for about three or four years now, and it's reducing their diesel fuel consumption uh, annually by about 30,000 gallons a year, 25 to 30,000 gallons a year. And we're receiving a, a stream of income from that as well. So essentially it's dollars instead of going to um, Diesel fuel is do dollars staying in the community at the cooperative, so it helps everybody. And like I said before, we're, we're saving about 20, 25% fuel savings right now, and um, a little more money coming in from electric heat at the hospital. Next slide. Uh, just a picture of our, um, this is our 900 kilowatt uh, EWT turbine. In the background are, is our smaller um, 1997 vintage wind turbines. So the, the State of Alaska Renewable Energy Fund really enabled us to go big. We never thought we'd ever be able to get a large wind turbine here in Cotsview, but the Renew Renewable Energy Fund uh, allowed that to happen. and. Um, um, it's been a game changer. The, the larger turbines are so much more reliable and maintainable compared to the, um, our older, smaller wind turbines. Next slide. Uh, here's a shot of our battery. It's just a 20 foot container packed with lithium ion batteries. And we have it essentially sitting in our substation at this point. Um, inside the powerhouse, you can't see it is the inverter. So the energy storage systems have two components, the, uh, the battery, the lithium ion batteries, and then they're wired to the inverter, which converts it from DC to AC power. And uh, that's been very beneficial for us um, um, in terms of using more renewables and limiting power outages. Next slide. And uh, here's our, our latest endeavor, which is solar. Um, this is uh, the, from, so you can see the, the solar arrays and they're next to these little white cubes. You can see those are the control shacks that used to have the wind turbine controls in them. Uh, the old wind turbines are still standing, but the plan this spring is to actually take down those small wind turbines. So we've, we've got this large area that we're essentially used to call our wind farm. Now we're calling our, our renewable farm. So we're um, planning to add more of these solar arrays. We see them as um, uh, a viable power source in terms of their uh, ease of construction and also their very low maintenance. Um, the construction project itself was great in terms of we had um, a crew of 10 to 12 local folks, kids I want to call them, that were able to all hand build these arrays. There was no specialized equipment or anything. It was all local hands-on labor. So it was a great project in terms of economic impact, but also in terms of its maintainability, there's just no, no moving parts. So it's, um, we'll see how it does through the first winter. 
Um, these are bifacial panels and we're expecting to see quite a bit of production starting in um, April, May, and uh, we'll see how it does through the year. But we're very keen on um, converting a lot of this small wind infrastructure that's essentially being decommissioned into solar. Next slide. Uh, this is our, our newest engine um, that's very efficient and very powerful and we um, the electronic fuel injection allows to respond very quickly to changes in renewable power output which happens which which happens you just have to deal with the vagaries of wind and solar production so having an engine like this is critical to utilizing renewables next slide and this is a picture of the, uh, at the local hospital, kind of the unveiling the, the orange box on the left is the electric boiler. It's a 450 kilowatt, um, basically just an electric water heater that's plumbed into the hospital heating system. And um, in the wintertime, when we, um, there's quite a bit of wind, we can heat the hospital just on electric heat for, we've gone as long as, um, 48 hours just heating the hospital on electric heat from too much wind that we have available. And um, it's it's pretty phenomenal, the, the effect. Next slide. So what we're shooting for, we're at about 20 to 25% generation right now um, from wind. What we're hoping to get to is sort of the economic break even point in terms of what you can do um, reasonably, which is achieve about 50% of your power generation from renewables. Um, to, to go beyond that and get into way too much battery, way too much solar, it just becomes cost prohibitive. So an achievable goal is to try to get to that 50% level of um, generation from renewables. So we're at um, aiming to double or even triple our wind production, install um, two or three more large EWT turbines, uh, complete the replacement of our small wind turbines with solar. We'll have about one megawatt of solar online. Um, the solar doesn't help in the winter, but it really helps. It matches our daily load in the summer. So we really see uh, solar as a great help. And then um, completing that transition of our automation system to be able to shut off the diesel engine totally uh, when you have enough renewables and you have a battery, a community scale energy storage battery in place, you're essentially using the battery to form your grid and then you're just dispatching diesel when you need it. And then finally doing quite a bit more beneficial electrification. Right now our only electric heat load is the hospital, but we're hoping to um, extend that opportunity to homes and other small businesses. So essentially, when we have too much wind or solar or both, being able to turn on a small uh, electric stove or electric water heater in um, each home to be able to offset um, stove oil consumption. So that's where we're going to. And why we're doing that and going to renewables is the big part is a more predictable cost of energy for the utility. Uh, right now, diesel fuel is historically cheap. We bought the cheapest diesel fuel this year than we bought in a long time. And um, But we know it can go the opposite direction rather quickly. So next year, um, the price of diesel fuel may double or triple or even more based on um, things that are out of our control. Um, and that's just the way things work. So if we can reduce our uncontrollable cost of energy as much as possible down to 50%, we can have more control of the other half of the cost coming from renewables. Um, and those cost of renewables aren't free, but they do have a, a fixed cost in terms of maintenance and average energy production. Uh, and then finally more local economic impact. Um, in terms of local jobs and beneficial electrification. Um, the obvious benefits of uh, environmental impacts and then also increased energy security. I mean, worst cases, you know, sometime down the road, 
we can't get diesel fuel or there's an issue with getting diesel fuel to, to Kotzebue, um, we'll be more reliant, self-reliant on local energy sources of, of wind and solar or what have you. So that's where Kotzebue is and um, happy to take any questions. Great. All right. Well, thank you to our presenters today. We do have some questions. It looks like we might go a little bit over, but uh, with everybody's indulgence, we can um, address some of these questions. Uh, I do want to go back to an earlier question uh, to uh, to Ingemar, and perhaps Matt would want to weigh in on, on this as well, as to uh, what would be the configuration of any uh, future uh, new distribution lines. So um, I, let's start back with Ingemar on that one. Yeah, so <clears throat> I was discussing the, the possible Amber Schoenach line that we've been considering for quite a while. And then um, it would involve also an upgrade, of course, of the power plant for AVAC in, uh, in Ambler. So looking at the entire cost, is it more of a funding issue than, a, than an issue of, of finance that it's actually paying for itself? It does over time. You just have to look at the longer time span of 10 to 20 years for payoff instead of just a few years, three to five years. So where to find the funding to do it? Um, the ones we have looked at is um, the Shunak Ambler one, since there's an existing Kobuk Shunak line already. <clears throat> and the other ones is Kayana, Norvik, Norvik, Selvik. And there is a uh, line being built right now in Kivalina, between Kivalina and the new school site, that may be the new community site at some point. The transmission lines, they pay for themselves and, and the technologies are advancing. It sounds like DC is now an option again as in new inverters has hit the market, market to go DC to AC, even in small communities. So it's a matter of, of uh, fun. All right. And Matt, any, any thoughts on that? Any new transmission lines? Yeah, I definitely think there's some opportunities for transmission um, between some of the communities that are closer together. Not sure if we'll ever be able to connect up um, Kotzebue to somewhere else, but um, you never know. You never know what's possible. But what we found actually is in terms of in-community in um, renewable utilization, we have a distribution feeder that had just the radio station tower on it that we're now using for power transmission from our renewable site back to town. So. In terms of the electrical engineering aspect um, in rural communities, the power lines need to be um, essentially transmission lines for future development. Okay, um, a quick question, um, I guess for everybody, uh, maybe some reflection and some speculation is, what's the secret sauce in the Northwest Arctic Borough? Uh, what is it that has made it possible for you guys to be such leaders and innovators in uh, renewable energy and new energy systems in rural Alaska? Mm -hmm. you, wanna, you wanna take that, start with that, Ingemar? Well, uh, I may take it, I may send it over to Matt because uh, KEA actually was the innovator up in, in, uh, in the region. And I think they started the first wind turbine back in 87. Maybe you want to speak to that vision a little bit first, Matt. Sure. Yeah. You know, we got a lot of time on our hands in the winter. We just think of what we can do to uh, do with all this cold wind that's blowing all winter. And um, that kind of what it boils down to with the um, Brad Reeve, our general manager for many years and the board of directors, they just said, you know, what can we do to take advantage of this wind and help um, reduce our, our biggest annual bill, which is diesel fuel. That's our biggest annual expense. You know, isn't there a way that we can harness this wind to reduce this big annual expense? And it just started, um, started from there. You know, we did a an analysis and said, oh yeah, there's pretty good wind. And then at that time in the 90s, you know, wind energy was becoming uh, a, a larger going concern, especially in California with the wind farms there. So it just sort of grew from trying a couple and a couple more. And um, now we're trying to fully 
utilize the wind to the maximum extent possible. So it just started with a, an idea and an effort, and it just grew from there. Great. How, Rob, how about you? Do you, do you have any observations uh, about what you see as, as the success factors in the Northwest Arctic Borough? Um, you know, what? the one thing that I continue to come back to um, is community. The, there is a, a willingness and a resiliency built into the community to explore these sorts of projects and these technologies. And then as a whole, you know, I've seen that not only extend throughout the entire state of Alaska in terms of, uh, you know, Matt and Ingomar's willingness to share lessons learned so that other communities can replicate their success, but in exporting that information um, outside of Alaska. We've got a, an enormous amount of institutional knowledge in operating these grids um, for decades now. Um, and with the efforts of, of people like Matt and Ingomar um, integrating renewables very early on, that is an expertise that is, has not come cheaply and has not come quickly. They've worked very hard um, to get to where they are today. And there's a massive amount of uh, knowledge and expertise that they've gained and accrued in that. And to be frank, they've shared it very willingly um, across borders. And, and to me, that is um, one of the key components for success. Great. Okay, um, a number of other questions coming in. Um, you know, one of the challenges in rural Alaska always is having that qualified workforce to maintain complicated systems. And can, uh, Matt and Ingemar, can you speak to how do you um, uh, identify, recruit, and retain qualified workforce to uh, manage these uh, systems? Sure, I'll take it first, okay. Ingemar. Go ahead, Matt. Yeah. Um, it's a couple that is a big challenge um so we we're approaching it from two directions one is to have um somebody or personnel more than one preferably on site um at with the utility that is familiar with how the equipment works and what to do to operate it and to sort of troubleshoot what's wrong reset it but then with the um, the advent of this thing called the internet, it's pretty amazing what technicians can do remotely to assist the local operator in troubleshooting uh, things that are wrong. So we do com a combination of um, remote internet support uh, for the local uh, operator, which is either me or one of our um, operators in the powerhouse. Um, but we still rely on an annual visit or two for the, a trained, you know, factory technician to do some preventive maintenance. Um, but what I sort of see as um, it's, we're still lacking in state and hopefully with the, um, the rail belt utilities adopting renewables and energy storage, uh, we won't be reliant on the lower 48 for technical support on our energy storage systems and renewables. Uh, this could kind of become a new state, in-state um, talent resource. Um, right now, we have technicians coming from Florida and North Carolina and elsewhere to work on these little systems, whereas if we had somebody in Fairbanks, Anchorage Valley that can respond a little quicker and are, and are familiar with cold weather, better serve um, the systems and keep them um, up and running longer. So. That's my, my two cents. Great, thanks. Ingemar? Yeah, I mean, to incorporate some training into the projects. For example, when we started to go uh, bigger with the solar arrays, we uh, got some funding together to train people locally at our tech center in Kotzebue. So we brought people in from communities to that training. And we did it again when we started to uh, incorporate heat pumps into the, into the discussion so that we had interested personnel, you send out a feeler to all the schools and all the principals and see where we can find uh, willing uh, students that are ready to get out of school and do something different if they want to learn it. So when we did the heat pump training, I know we had about 15 people responding all over the region to come in and do the training for certification for, for heat pump installation, for example. So building the local capacity is always on our agenda one way or another. 
Uh, we may not retain them, but we hope we do. People do jump in and out of the region, but um, it builds more skills and it's really important. And KA did a wonderful job on, on the solar array they built in, in Kotzebue. They're using local, local uh, people in, in installations. And we're planning the same for the Shungna Kobuk installation coming up here for about 200 kilowatts. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question, and I mean, I think this is always a challenge in rural Alaska, where, and particularly where you're working now to innovate towards um, a new alternative renewable energy. Um, what's the prospect for being able to accommodate a large scale economic development project? Say, for example, new infrastructure, uh, a port, uh, a road, um, another new public facility or a large scale economic development project like a mine is coming on um, online or could come online. How, how um, are the utilities poised to address a project like that to incorporate some larger scale project? Um, Matt, do you wanna start with that? Sure. Um, yeah, I would say um, a port um, or some sort of large scale load uh, where would essentially help uh, the cooperative here. Um, we've sort of seen um, through efficiency, through uh, whatever the, the weather uh, or the climate warming, our, our load and essentially our, essentially our sales are, are down. So we're always eager to um, have more customers. Uh, it helps the economics of the cooperative. Um, a, a large scale mine would be a little harder for us to adapt to, but we have the capacity for and are planning to um, power any kind of port facility that may be in in the Kotzebue area. Um, so yeah, we're we're kind of poised for future development and uh, look forward to it. Um, I would I would sort of what. We try to do is try to work early and often with anybody or any entity that's trying to develop something <clears throat> so that we can plan plan that in terms of providing power or distribution to where they might be. So we sort of see ourselves as, as trying to help encourage economic development in the region as much as possible. Ingemar? Yeah, um, the discussions are always there, you know, in, in uh, one of the state committee meetings and in local meetings and our assembly meetings, the energy structure and um, cost of energy, it seems to be the basis for everything we do in particular in economics development. And we, we're constantly looking at it. If we change something at one end of the borough, it may affect people in the other side of the borough. And what we have found is that it's kind of, uh, really important for for the borough to be regionalized in all these aspects so that so that uh, uh, everybody realizes it's, it's it's everybody sitting in the, in the same boat if you lower the cost of electricity or, or or fuel in one community it's going to affect what happens in another community in particular on transportation and fuel so those discussions are always there as, as at the bottom okay Great, thanks. We have, we have about three more questions, so um, if you'll indulge us. Uh, just a question in that, uh, to some degree, uh, the reliance on diesel obviously is going to continu continue into the future. And I'm just wondering, um, uh, obviously you've spoken today about um, improving um, the generation capacity, new, new uh, um, generations of uh, diesel, um, uh, infrastructure, but in terms of purchasing diesel fuel, are there any efforts to, um, to manage uh, the purchase of diesel fuel in the region to help lower the administrative cost of getting uh, fuel into um, the Northwest Arctic Borough? Yes, uh, that has been an ongoing discussion to try to get all the various entities in our region to do a bulk buy together and um, for for it's it's been a challenge but it's still an effort that we're working towards um, the West Coast electric utilities have been buying fuel together 
for uh, several years the Western Alaska Fuel Group and were able to achieve quite a bit of fuel savings. Um, <clears throat> but that is um, something that Ingemar has been pushing in the borough to try to get the, um, the school district, AVEC, the local communities to go in on a bulk, bulk purchase. Um, alternatively, you know, Topsby Electric, we're sort of open to any fuel source. We'll burn what's cheapest or least expensive. And um, one of the long-term hopes is that um, natural gas may be a viable fuel source here in the region in the distant future. So um, that's where kind of where we're at. Hey, Ingemar, any, any comments on that? Yeah, um, so the fuel is the number, of course. It, it's the base for everything we do. And uh, uh, out in the communities, I, I don't know if you can put up my slide real quick there, Rob, but the one that shows the fuel cost and the retail cost versus the landed cost for AVAC in the school system. So uh, most communities would like to have something at least the $2 markup on the fuel. And uh, a lot of them has more than that. There's also the tax that's included so that we can never bring down the cost of households to two or three dollars that it's landed for. Um, one of the reason that once the fuel price start going up in the communities, it doesn't come down is um, that the revenue for each little community to function administratively is going down. And they don't have any, any other resource than to keep the price high on the fuel to have enough money to run the administration of the community. So let's say, you know, Ambler there, I'm familiar with since I'm living there. And even though they can, under some circumstances, buy the fuel at four fifty, six to five dollars, six dollars landed uh, at the at the barge, uh, at least half of the fuel is flown in at about six, seven dollars, and then marked up three, three fifty plus the tax. Um, so, what could happen is what we're looking at is uh, the North Atlantic Borough School System has ability to accommodate. Uh, a small buy together option, maybe for the high cost villages that land on public and get that landed price of 440 for them. It's also a capacity. Some communities like Ambler don't have capacity to be able to buy for the entire year. They can only buy for a few months at a time, and that brings the cost up. And um, the more we try to combine the region into one buying co-op, the more reluctant our two sellers, Vitus and Crowley are to, to uh, play with that. They don't wanna lose customers on either side and the prices are all different. In the same community at the same time, you can have three different prices going off the barge depending on when they bought the fuel and uh, how much they're buying at any given time. So it's, it's no easy solution to that, um, except that we're trying to regionalize more and more and look at it more holistically at, uh, from the larger perspective. Yeah, I think I've always found it fascinating that, um, for example, a, um, a, I, I'm familiar with, with the Brevig mission that, uh, you know, the fuel, the same fuel coming in on the same barge could actually have four different prices depending on who the buyer is. And uh, so it does seem, um, just so, sort of unconscionable that that there really are four different uh, prices in such a small locality. But um, at any rate, uh, I, I have a couple of questions. Rob, this one is for you. Um, can you speak to, I mean, we're hearing about, you know, some of the innovations going on in the Northwest Arctic Borough and uh, combining different uh, forms of renewable uh, to leverage the strength of each. But can you talk about what are some new energy technologies that are coming to Alaska? And what are you seeing on the horizon, not only in terms of uh, being able to use new technologies, but developing unique technologies in state? Sure. You know, I think right now the, the primary challenge is um, proving technologies. You know, frankly, wind and solar have been around for quite some time, but they've had quite of a, an on-ramp, if you will, to being 
deployed and integrated in the Arctic. Um, and there's a lot of logistical challenges around those. Um, so there are certainly um, new technologies that we continue to consider. Um, and, and I'll just shout out to ASEP as one of the organizations that does a fantastic job of helping identify and bring those to the state. Um, examples of those are things like um, hydro, in-river hydro or uh, tidal um, uh, elect generation. Um, and there's been a few efforts um, on that front. I think there's a, a pilot project, either current or, or ongoing in Tanana, um, as well as a community, Igiagig, um, that has an in-river hydro on the Quijac. Um, so that's one good example. Another um, from the Launch Alaska organization is a support of a company called Oklo, which does micro nuclear. Um, and so, you know, looking at, um, you know, in some ways that's not a, a new technology at all, but the way that I look at innovation is that it's um, often a repurposing um, or reorientation of an existing technology for a new application. And so micronuclear in many ways is very exciting um, because it begins to reach towards the scale of our um, rural communities, um, as well as providing long-term um, levelized cost of energies. Uh, so those are two immediately off the top of my head. I haven't mentioned a, a huge list of others that includes um, organic rake and cycle um, generation, uh, biomass. Uh, there's quite a litany of them. And, um, you know, I'd suggest if you want to do a little bit further research, the Alaska Energy Authority and the Renewable Energy Funds um, uh, Atlas for uh, uh, resources throughout the state as well as projects that are being explored is an excellent resource. Great. Great, thanks. Um, can you, uh, can anyone speak to uh, the adaptability of existing diesel plants to use alternative fuels uh, like hydrogen, ammonia, or LNG? What would it take to be able to convert those plants or make them adaptable? Uh, I could take a shot at that. Go ahead, Matt. Um, yeah, hydrogen. Um, like, like I mentioned, there's, we're, we sort of see being able to get to 50% using um, just wind and solar and battery. But in terms of um, hydrogen, that may be something that be becomes more of a going concern. It has been before. It kind of has pits and starts. Ingemar probably has more information on hydrogen, but that could be something that we look to in the future to get even further um, further reduce our diesel fuel consumption. If we're able to produce a hydrogen more cost effectively than storing power from wind and solar, and then at somehow burn or use the fuel for power generation at a later time, that's just another technology that we can use to further limit the amount of imported diesel that we have. So um, in terms of, uh, it, I don't see, it, I'm not sure, it, it may be possible to inject it into our existing equipment. That may be a possibility, maybe something that should be looked at um, because um, if you can essentially continue using your existing assets, that just makes things um, more cost effective in the big picture. So that's what I got. Ingemar? Well, I can speak to it as far as logistics goes. Um, we, we've looked a little bit at propane deliveries or, or natural gas deliveries, but the logistics of moving isotanks between the communities is financially and logistically uh, not a doable thing in a shallow rivers that may only be high once during the summer. So um, Kotzebue may be able to do something like that and more local communities at the coast, but interior, every time we looked at it, it's, it seems um, an obstacle that is not something that we can go to. The, it, certainly it needs to be researched and, and tried out and everything else as a alternative. And like Matt said, if we had enough electricity production somewhere to produce hydrogen and store it, that's probably what should happen. Uh, there might be something on the horizon on both ammonia and hydrogen at some point. 
Well, we're um, we're almost at 20 minutes over time. Um, I, I did want to uh, say that um, I, uh, Mira Kohler provided a comment on the different pricing uh, for diesel, uh, and obviously saying that you know large anchor tenants or buyers, um, uh, you know, are buying larger quantities and can prepay for their fuel, whereas smaller buyers may be uh, shifting some of those administrative costs onto the fuel supplier. So um, that that may uh, require uh, you know, higher prices for various customers who are buying smaller quantities. So thanks for that comment, Mira. Um, probably we could go on for quite a bit longer, but since we are running over time, I think what we'll do is, is uh, thank our, our speakers. Uh, I again want to thank Isaac Vanderberg with Launch Alaska and um, Rob Royce for helping to organize this panel and um, to Ingemar and Matt for being with us today. Uh, before I hand it back to Mead for any final comments, I do want to just uh, highlight that we have another session today at noon with Senator Lisa Murkowski. We'll be talking about pending federal legislation that will be impacting Alaska's Arctic. Um, and you can visit commonwealthnorth.org and under the events tab for more information about that session today. Next week, we will be hearing from a panel talking about Arctic fisheries. We'll be hearing from Steve McLean with uh, North Pacific Fishery Management Council, as well as Stephanie Madsen with the ATSI um, uh, Processors Association, and Simon Kameen with the Norton Sound Economic Development Corporation. So please plan on joining us next week for that session as well. It's also available on our website for registration now. Uh, we do have uh, coming up in November, I just want to highlight on November 12th, we will be presenting the Hickel and Egan Awards, this year's honorees for the uh, Walter J. Hickel Award for um, Distinguished Leadership in Public Policy are the late Jacob Adams and Oliver Levitt with um, Arctic Slope Regional Corporation in the community of Utkiagnik. And we also will be recognizing uh, Tara Sweeney with the William A. Egan Award for Distinguished Alaskan. Uh, so please uh, uh, plan on joining us for that event as well. And with that, let me turn it over to Mead for any closing comments. Mead? Thank you, uh, Juanetta. And I, I also want to thank our speakers, uh, Rob, Matt, Ingemar. That was one of the most uh, uh, informative presentations on rural energy I've heard in a long time. And uh, I, I just uh, uh, really want to compliment you on your work. I have a request, a piece of homework. Uh, on, online with us is uh, Cal Stevenson, who's helping us write the next draft of the, uh, of the Arctic Study Report uh, outline. And any recommendations that you think Commonwealth North should include in, a, in an Arctic Study Report on rural energy, we would be very interested in having. And whether it's uh, you know, trying to transfer these internationally, try to do them more in the rail belt, uh, get to goals on transmission, uh, uh, do more R&D in some of the areas that you've talked about. All are fair game. Uh, we heard a lot of good things today. So uh, please uh, be back in touch and uh, uh, keep doing your good work. And uh, uh, I really want to thank uh, Isaac and Bob Cox for also for pushing for this program. Uh, and with that, uh, I think we're adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Good morning.